Joining us today as guest speakers are Christopher Stewart from Newcastle University, Mark Brown from Case Western Reserve University, Craig Wheelock from Karolinska Institute, and Adarsh Sandhu from Noster, whom we will learn more about shortly. Did you know your body houses a complex network of microorganisms capable of producing life-saving compounds? Researchers are leveraging these internal alchemists to create new effective therapies for a range of models. His group has recently discovered novel probiotic candidates that colonize healthy infants and produce important natural products. Such research has wide implications for better understanding diet-microbe-host interaction, with potential to develop novel disease biomarkers and targeted therapeutic interventions to promote health. Dr. Brown is a staff member in the Department of Cancer Biology at the Cleveland Clinic Learner Research Institute and also the Director of Research in the Center for Microbiome and Human Health at the Cleveland Clinic. His research program has focused on the interrelationship between abnormal lipid metabolism and the development of chronic metabolic diseases such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and gastrointestinal cancers. Dr. Brown's laboratory has spearheaded NIH-funded research programs surrounding mechanisms by which gut microbial metabolites promote cardiovascular and alcoholic and non-alcoholic liver disease. Another focus of Dr. Brown's research program surrounds functional characterization of host genetic variants associated with obesity and liver disease. Dr. Wheelock is head of the unit of integrative metabolics at the Institute of Environmental Medicine at the Karolinska Institute and director of the Small Molecule Mass Spectrometry Core Facility. Research in his group focuses on molecular phenotyping of respiratory disease with a particular interest in investigating the role of lipid mediators in pulmonary physiology. Research, recent efforts have centered on understanding the role of lipid mediators deviated from 18 carbon containing dietary fatty acids, such as linoleic and alpha linoleic acid in lung disease. These so-called octadecanoids represent a new subclass of bioactive lipids that are potentially involved in gut lung crosstalk. The overarching aim of the Wheelock Lab is to identify personalized molecular profiles that can be associated with the individual's lifestyle, environmental exposure, and susceptibility to asthma. Dr. Sandhu received his PhD from the University of Manchester and is now an emeritus professor at the University of Electrocommunications, Tokyo. With nearly 40 years in Japan, his academic journey began with a MEXT scholarship, leading to studies at the Tokyo Institute of Technology and the Institute of Industrial Science, University of Tokyo. He has held tenured positions at Fujitsu Laboratories, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and the University of Electrocommunications until March 2023. He is currently the Chief Scientific Officer and a member of the Board of Directors at Noster Incorporated in Kyoto. His research focuses on developing therapeutics based on metabolites or postbiotics produced by gut microbes. Welcome to all our speakers. We're going to start with our first speaker, Dr. Stewart. Dr. Stewart, thank you for joining us today. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and thank you very much to, to Noster and Science for the invitation to um, share some of our recent work with you all today. So I'm going to be talking about our work based in Newcastle here on preterm infants primarily, although it does have wider ramifications for, for um, humans across the life course. And I'll focus on largely unpublished data, um, which I think has real therapeutic potential here as maybe a probiotic, but almost certainly as a, a postbiotic in infants. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those terms mean in the presentation today. So we know the microbiome, as mentioned, is really critically important throughout the life course, but this is especially true during the first year of life. And during this period, the microbiome is at its most developmental. We're born sterile and quickly colonized by, by microbes, which change quite drastically over the first 12 months. And in this time, this play really important roles in different facets of human health and some of those are listed here and many others as well not listed and the impact here is is widespread it's not just for the infant during this time period but can see much longer term health to to that individual however in the case of a preterm infant and as mentioned that will be defined as those born less than 32 weeks of gestation so significantly premature they're housed and in hospital for the first 
uh, months of their life, they're more likely to be delivered by cesarean section, more likely to receive antibiotics, less likely to receive maternal breast milk, and many other factors that we know can perturb their microbiome and development. And this in turn has been linked to a range of different diseases. And my group are particularly interested in necrotizing enterocolitis or NEC, which is an inflammatory mediated bowel disease and the leading cause of death in preterm infants. So work going back a while, a few years now from, from when I was a postdoc at Baylor College of Medicine showed, and others have supported this result, that breast milk and diet is really the driver of infant microbiome over that critical first year of life period. And when an infant is receiving breast milk, they have an abundance of bacteria such as bifidobacterium. And so a lot of work has been trying to disentangle why certain bacteria really proliferate and reach high abundance during the course, uh, during the time when they're receiving breast milk. And so breast milk contains a huge wrath of bioactive components, but perhaps the most well studied is human milk oligosaccharides. So these are complex sugars that are the third most abundant solid component in breast milk. But despite that, they provide no direct nutritional benefit to the infant. So instead, they reach the small and the large intestine intact, where they're broken down by what are thought to be beneficial bacteria. And there's a saying, um, an old saying, which is nothing makes sense in biology unless viewed in light of evolution. And I think that especially applies here. Breast milk has clearly been crafted over the course of evolution to meet the many demands of a growing individual, of a growing infant. And the fact these sugars exist at such high amounts clearly do support their really critical role in seeding that beneficial microbiome. And so really they do act primarily as prebiotics as shown here on the left of this um, schematic. And it's not just the presence of those bacteria, something that we're gonna get in today increasingly through these talks is that the bacteria are actually producing metabolites and natural products, which are potentially in most cases, the mediators of the improved health we see. There's other aspects related to, to human milk oligosaccharides, not related to prebiotics, but primarily they're there to feed the bacteria. So we've done a study a few years ago. This was led by Andrea Massey and my group at Newcastle and in collaboration with Lars's board, Lars Bordier's group in UC San Diego. And we looked at neck infants and matched controls and found that those infants who went on to develop this deadly disease had significantly different HMO profiles in the milk they were receiving compared to matched controls. And in particular, it was driven by a single sugar in breast milk, which was really abundant in healthy babies and, and, and really low in infants who went on to develop necrotizing enterocolitis. This sugar is called disiolactoenteterose or DSLNT. And this also validated some work from Lars and others previously. So there does seem to be something critically important as well about this specific sugar in breast milk. So really the basis of our novel probiotic or postbiotic discovery is using what we already know from evolution that many of these breast milk bioactives are there to provide substrates to the bacteria. Can we better understand what they are and which bacteria they feed and in turn what those bacteria actually produce in terms of their natural products? And then ultimately, can we understand the mechanism as to how these natural products actually improve health in a given individual? So we started this journey really quite simply by taking a huge number of preterm uh, isolates from poo samples, growing them on media with different HMOs in this example, and then finding which bacteria could use which different sugars. And through a lot of work, again, led by Andrea and also John Chapman, a postdoc in my group, uh, we found many different bacteria can use these sugars for their growth. And you'll see a lot of strain to strain variability in which sugars and to what extent they're able to use them and grow. So that bifidobacterium as noted by these circles could use HMOs was something that was well published and probably explains why bifidobacterium really dominate breastfed infants. And we also discovered that clostridium species many different species and again strain to strain level uh, variation within their utilization but they're able to use these HMOs as well. From this point I'm going to talk about um, largely the AM1 isolate. This is because it the one that clusters most closely to B. infantis, which was a probiotic isolate. And it also is the best utilizer of DSLNT in all of the isolates we've tested. And as noted previously, 
bacteria using DSLNT is potentially one mechanism whereby high DSLNT in milk is protective against uh, necrotizing enterocolitis in our cohort studies. Okay, so you might be thinking Clostridium can use HMOs, that's really cool, but is this really good bacteria using HMOs? Surely Clostridium are often considered pathogenic or potentially pathogenic. And that's certainly the case for Clostridium, which have uh, toxin genes, in particular the PFOA or perfringial lysing activity toxin gene. And so what um, really seminal and beautiful work by Lindsay Hall's lab showed last year was the vast majority of infants have Clostridium perfringens and do not get neck, but when they do go on to develop disease, their Clostridium perfringens has this toxin gene. But on the flip side, there's a hypovirulent lineage. That is, if a bacteria is present or Clostridium perfringens is present in this lineage, it lacks that gene and is actually associated with better outcomes. And worth noting the isolate that I'm gonna talk about, the AM1 isolate also sits in this lineage. Work from our uh, lab also shows that healthy controls typically have greater levels of Clostridium, significantly more so than infants who go on to develop neck. Again, uh, suggesting here that on cohort level, Clostridium may be beneficial. So I'll talk a little bit in the last few minutes about postbiotics because there are some controversies around using live microbial therapies for vulnerable populations like preterm infants. So can we basically remove those cells but harvest the, the supernatant and all of those lovely natural products that those bacteria are producing? So an example is short chain fatty acids. If we compare Clostridium postbiotics uh, to the sort of gold standard in bifido, we expectedly see less acetate, but far more breadth of short chain fatty acids being produced, in particular, much greater abundance uh, amounts or concentrations of butyrate being produced, which bifidobacterium uh, simply don't produce this particular short chain fatty acids. And many, many other metabolites, such as tryptophan catabolites that I won't have time to go into today. On the microbial ecology point of view, what would this postbiotic do to other microbes in that preterm ecosystem? So we tested that using these cultured isolates from preterm infant stool samples. These are typically considered pathobionts or sort of negative or bad bacteria for a preterm infant. And what we found is our clostridium derived postbiotic is able to inhibit for the most part those bad bacteria. But when it comes to beneficial bacteria like bifidobacterium, Again, for the most part, it's actually able to promote the growth of those particular bacteria. And some of our mechanistic work suggests this may be linked to the production of short chain fatty acids and reduction in pH in the lumen, but there are also other mechanisms at play. So I finally just wanted to touch on the host side. So I've just talked about this postbiotic seems to inhibit pathogenic and promote beneficial bacteria, but what does it do to the human epithelium, the intestinal um, epithelium? So to do that, we use organoids. My lab uses infant organoid models a lot, particularly preterm infants. So when a baby sadly has a surgery and has resected tissue, we isolate the stem cells and effectively regrow that tissue in the lab. These tissues contain all the major cell types of the intestinal epithelium and they have the patient specificity in terms of their sort of epigenetic and genetic predisposition to disease. And we also recently developed a core culture system in collaboration with Baylor College of Medicine that allows us to core culture anaerobic bacteria with oxygen requiring human cells. And so this is our model system and this is sort of our experimental design where we spike in these inflammatory microbial inflammatory stimuli and we can test how our postbiotic with and without stimuli at different concentrations may be able to reverse that inflammatory phenotype. And a very quick synopsis of that data, if we sample apical or luminal media versus basal lateral or sort of submucosal media, what we see in terms of pro-inflammatory cytokine production is that as expected our stimuli causes a huge significant increase in IL-8 pro-inflammatory cytokine production. But if we add our postbiotic, even in the presence of these stimuli, we're able to significantly suppress that pro-inflammatory response. And this is true for other cytokines that we've measured as well, and many others that I won't have time to get into today. So uh, in summary, I won't talk today about the direct role of HMOs, but most evidence in our group really points towards the, the primary mode of action being prebiotics, 
feeding bacteria like bifidobacterium and clostridium, which we know can produce these natural products and have a range of important implications towards host health. And so now we're thinking much more about how can we leverage this therapeutically. As, as I said, I think there's a discussion to be had around use of postbiotics and potentially probiotics in this population. So with that, I'll thank the very many people that's been involved in the work to date um, for their contributions, as well as the funders. And I'll be very happy to take any questions that the audience has, uh, which I understand is going to be after the series of talks. So um, please post questions in the chat and we'll get to them um, at the appropriate time. So thank you very much for your attention. Indeed. Many thanks to Dr. Stewart for his insightful presentation. We will now hear from Dr. Brown. Okay, so uh, thank you to Science and Noster for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm going to use these two pictures on the first slide to kind of summarize what I'm going to tell you. Um, and the first part, like we heard from Christopher, is the fact that when we eat a meal, so we're focused mostly on the gut microbiome, the bacteria in our gut actually eat certain macronutrient, micronutrient components of that diet and produce interesting metabolites that are either associated with cardiovascular, cardiometabolic disease, or in some cases we think causative. There's also beneficial metabolites. And then I think the most interesting piece of this is, is we've uh, thought of ways to drug the, the gut microbial uh, production of these metabolites via small molecule inhibitors of bacterial enzymes. So uh, a little bit of history, my training is really in lipid lipoprotein metabolism. And when I was a postdoc, we were studying a process called reverse cholesterol transport. This is a good process mediated by HDL that brings cholesterol from the artery wall plaque back to the liver and excretes that into the feces. So this is a, a drug target by many companies. And we were studying different mechanisms. And out of that investigation, we, uh, we actually, for, for brevity, I'm just gonna uh, talk about the two models we used. We had models where cholesterol excretion into the feces was increased and we uh, did transcriptional profiling in the liver of those mice and actually found that a gene called flavin monooxygenase 3 fmo3 was suppressed in both of those models of enhanced cholesterol disposal uh, at the time this is probably early 2010 uh, we didn't know how to interpret this because fmo3 is actually a xenobiotic metabolizing enzyme it's an enzyme involved in uh, uh, also bacterial metabolite production. So initially we knocked down, we inhibited that enzyme in the liver and uh, it's uh, involved in a gut, a diet micro post pathway. So just briefly, uh, substrates such as carnitine, phosphatidylcholine, choline uh, are metabolized by gut microbial enzymes to make the first metabolite called trimethylamine. And then FMO3, the host liver enzyme, converts that to TMAO. And what we found uh, is when we inhibit that uh, enzyme that converts this bacterial metabolite to this secondary metabolite, it changed cholesterol metabolism uh, in diverse ways. And you can read that in this paper. Uh, at the same time, completely unbeknownst to us, there were four other groups that stumbled on this pathway through unbiased approaches. So. Uh, the first was Stan Hazen's group here at the Cleveland Clinic as well. Stan was using uh, untargeted metabolomics and cardiovascular disease case control uh, populations. And what he found was not FMO3, but the enzymatic product, this trimethylamine N oxide, was associated with cardiovascular disease risk. And that's been repeated many times in many diverse populations. Uh, there was another group at UCLA, uh, Jake Lucis who was using what's called the hybrid mouse diversity panel, which is a, a, a lots of different strains of mice where some are very susceptible to high fat diet induced cardiometabolic disease. And what Jake found was that plasma TMAO and uh, adipose FMO3 was strikingly associated with adiposity and insulin resistance. And then yet another group, Suda Bittinger at uh, the Jocelyn and um, uh, in, in Boston, she found that uh, in this mouse model of insulin resistance called the Lurco mouse, this is a hepatocyte specific knockout of the insulin receptor. Uh, she did much like Stan Hazen's group, she used untargeted metabolomics 
and found that TMAO was elevated in that insulin resistant mouse. And the expression of FMO3, the enzyme that makes TMAO, was a thousand fold uh, increased. And she linked this to downstream signaling through uh, the FOXO1 transcription factor. So um, I'm just going to summarize a ton of work. Um, this is just showing uh, in people in two different cohorts with type 2 diabetes. If you have elevated levels of, of TMAO, you're more likely to have type 2 diabetes. But this pathway has been associated with almost every age-related uh, disease that humans are faced with. So we've been really been focused on can we drug this pathway from either a microbial or, or host uh, perspective. So you can completely get rid of TMA, TMAO with broad spectrum antibiotics. That's not a long term fix. Um, you can control dietary substrate, but phosphatidylcholine isn't everything, even if you're eating pure vegan diet. Uh, we've done a lot of work where we've inhibited the host enzyme in the liver, FMO3, and definitely see benefit but it's not really a therapeutic target because there are human mutations in FMO3 that cause a very terrible disease called fish odor syndrome or trimethylamineuria. So if you lack TMA to TMAO conversion, you accumulate TMA, which smells like rotting fish. So we've abandoned uh, all ships there. Instead, we've worked collaboratively with Stan Hazen uh, since I moved to the Cleveland Clinic uh, to go after bacterial enzyme inhibitors. So I'm just going to show you a couple examples of small molecule enzyme inhibitors of the choline TMA lice, cut C, cut D. So initially what Stan's group did in this uh, 2015 paper was they made a choline analog that actually binds the active site of the bacterial TMA lice uh, and inhibit choline to trimethylamine production. Fed that to mice, APOE knockouts, and saw less atherosclerosis. So that was kind of the first proof of concept that maybe you could drug a microbial enzyme and have a benefit in the host. And then since then, Stan has a really talented group of uh, medicinal chemists in this group. So this was that first compound, which had an IC50 against the, the enzyme activity of 10 micromolar. Some of these newer compounds are 10,000 fold more potent and have in vivo efficacy. efficacy. So, um, uh, the initial uh, uh, class of compounds that we've used are halomethylcholines, and you can read more about that in this 2018 paper. Uh, so the way that these work, uh, they're mechanism-based inhibitors that uh, engage the active site and really never leave the active site. So a single dose, uh, you get very robust reductions in TMA, TMAO, don't change choline or co-metabolites betaine. And if we look at where the drug is, the red is fecal levels of the drug. So most of the drug is excreted in the feces and the black is, is plasma levels. So the drug doesn't actually systemically circulate, but it very robustly reduces those gut microbial metabolites. So um, initially we did a high fat diet induced obesity study where we incorporated the drug into the diet. So you can see the drugs blunt TMA, TMAO production. Uh, the mice ate the same amount throughout the, the study, uh, but they weigh significantly less. They had improvements in glucose tolerance, improvements in hepatic triglycerides. Um, this study really still blows me away, but uh, what we did here is we fed this to hyperphagic OBOB leptin deficient mice. So this was just a chow formulation. We gave the drug. They eat a lot of the drug, so there's no detectable TMA, TMAO, very effective. Uh, choline levels were not affected. Uh, the drug treated mice actually ate significantly more than the controls, but striking, we haven't given back leptin, but we've reduced body weight 10 to 15 grams uh, across the study. So this is associated with just marked enhancement of energy expenditure, brown adipose tissue uh, thermogenic responses. So I'm just going to summarize in this, this last slide what we think is going on. And happy to discuss the data to support uh, where the mechanisms are. But what we think is going on is when we eat high fat diets, uh, diets rich in, in choline, carnitine, other dietary substrates, our bacteria are eating those first. They're making a postprandial spike in both TMA, TMAO. These are real data in mice. We see the same thing in people. And that postprandial release 
particularly TMA, we know can engage a host GPCR. It's called trace amine associated receptor five. And we've linked that signaling TMA to TAR5 to alterations in host circadian rhythms. And we think that ties together the link to all of these different cardiometabolic diseases. There's also, you know, a likely host receptor or multiple receptors, including the PERC ER kinase uh, uh, that can directly interact with TMAO. But that happens mostly in platelets and uh, and more of a thrombotic effect. Uh, so just uh, to, to finalize the discussion, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, we're really keen on understanding not only the TMAO pathway, but many diverse microbial metabolites. And we're really interested in being able to comprehensively measure these in biospecimens. Uh, so if you're interested in measuring any of these on the list or others, um, please contact me because uh, we're really uh, focused within the Center of Microbiome and Human Health on the bacterially derived metabolome uh, as a therapeutic target in, in multiple diseases. So uh, I'll just acknowledge the people that did the work. Uh, Rebecca Sugar, Manya Warrior did most of the, the FMO3 work that I discussed. Very active collaborations with Stan Hazen, Zanang Wang and his group, uh, Jay Clusis as well uh, at UCLA. Um, and other folks at, at different points in the funding. So I will stop there and look forward to the discussion. All right. Thank you for your intriguing talk, Dr. Brown. Our next speaker today will be Dr. Wheelock. Uh, so my name is Craig Wheelock. As I said, I'm at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. I'm very happy to be here. And what I'll be talking about today is a group of molecules that are certainly our favorite molecules. These are called the octadecanoids. And this is a class, uh, relatively new, described class of lipid mediators, which can be derived from microbiome processes. So to set the stage a little bit, I'd like to talk initially about our relationship with what we consider to be you know, healthy dietary fat. As you can see in the slide here, our thoughts about what constitutes healthy fat has certainly evolved with time. And one could say that there is you know, some unclarity about you know, what considers a, a good or, quote, bad fat profile. And I think one of the reasons behind this is that when we're considering the health effects of dietary fatty acids, it's also important to consider that most of these fatty acids are going to be further metabolized to downstream metabolic products, which in many cases can exert function, as we saw in Dr. Brown's talk recently. The uh, slide you see here is just showing standard fatty acid metabolism. We have um, the omega-6 fatty acids, the omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, the most well-known lipid mediators would be the acaisinoids here being produced from the C20 fatty acids. But we see equivalent cascades coming from the C22 fatty acids and then the C18 fatty acids, the octadecanoids, what we'll be talking about today. So I said the arachidonic acid cascade or the caisinoids are the most well-known pathway. There's been literally two Nobel Prizes awarded in this space, and they interact with you know, many of the current anti-inflammatory, anti-pain medications that we use. From a chemical standpoint, if you look at the structural complexity of this, this is just a, a pathway overview. There's you know, hundreds to thousands of different lipid mediators being produced in the C20 pathway. We see analogous cascades from the omega-3 fatty acids. So this is the so-called fish oils, um, DHA and EPA, for example, that are producing lipid mediators that have uh, putative roles in the resolution of inflammatory processes. But then what we've been starting to try and define is that there's analogous cascades that are being produced from the C18 fatty acids. So here's uh, our attempt to draw the cascade to being produced from linoleic acid. If you're interested in this, there's a QR code in the slide that'll take you to a recent review we wrote about this. And then we see, of course, a ca cascade coming from the omega-3 counterpart, the alpha-linolenic acid. There also are other fatty acids. I've only talked about uh, linoleic and alpha-linolenic, but there are a whole range of C18 fatty acids, many of which can go through the same types of conversion processes to produce corresponding cascades. So suffice it to say, there are hundreds to thousands of different putative octadecanoid mediators being produced from these different fatty acid substrates. But to focus on linoleic acid itself, if you look at the history, during the 1900s, we saw a major shift in the way that we consumed uh, fat in our diet. 
And that now we switch from primarily saturated fat from basically a butter-based diet to unsaturated fat with a vegetable oil-based diet. And now linoleic acid is the most widely consumed polyunsaturated fatty acid in the Western diet. There's been a number of investigations of this, and some say that it has positive effects, some say negative effects, and there's a, a lot of discrepancy in the literature about this, but many studies, and the majority of studies, show that there is a link between dietary linoleic acid consumption and inflammation and metabolic diseases. But what there is a lack of is knowledge about how these shifts in dietary levels of linoleic acid are affecting the physiological roles and the, particularly the molecular, molecular mechanisms that would be driving this. And the focus on the metabolic products of linoleic acid and analogs, these so-called octadecanoids. What has been shown is that a number of these molecules are immunomodulatory and being produced by the microbiome. And that's what I'll be doing today is showing you some examples of this from literature. So taking a recent review shown here, we could see that it's accepted knowledge now that the, the gut microbiome is converting dietary lipids into a whole range of downstream metabolites with biological activities. I won't go through the details of this slide, but you can see for yourself a number of the different lipid products that are being made and their associated function. So this leads us to the idea that gut dysbiosis is going to affect how we convert our dietary fat into downstream lipometer products that will be exerting physiological roles in health and disease. My lab focuses primarily on the gut and lung axis. We're interested in respiratory disease and how dietary fatty acids are metabolized in the gut and how the products affect the etiology of lung disease. So what I'll do in the next few minutes is give some examples from a range of studies in the literature showing the powerful effects that some of these dietary derived lipid mediators can affect in the lung. Going back in ancient history, and this is a paper from Bruce Hammack and colleagues um, from the late 90s, which looked at a production of compounds called leukotoxins. So here we see linoleic acid is converted by cytochrome P450s to the corresponding epoxides called leukotoxins, which are in turn hydrolyzed by the epoxide hydrolase to the vicinal diols shown here. These are called leukotoxin diols. The more common nomenclature these days is the epomes for the epoxides or the dihomes for the diols. And we'll talk a lot about these today. This paper in Nature Medicine showed very nicely that these epoxide leukotoxins were associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. Flash forward to the COVID epidemic, and there's a number of papers come out by us and others showing that, again, that these leukotoxin compounds from linoleic acid have a major role in the etiology of ARDS in severe COVID. This earlier paper showed that actually it was the diol metabolite, this dihome, that was toxic to alveolar epithelial cells. And if you inhibited the epoxide hydrolase, you could reduce the toxicity associated with the epoxides. So in other words, it's not the epoxide that's exerting, exerting the effect, it's the diol product. Going back even earlier, this is some work from Ozawa and colleagues in Japan in the 80s, where they took these linoleic acid compounds. And they them. Say it again? Was that a comment? Hmm. Um, if you look at these uh, rat lungs, you can see what happens, this massive pulmonary edema that occurs once you've injected um, these epoxides into the tail vein of a rat. Going to more recent work, uh, Sue Lynch and colleagues at UC San Francisco published a very interesting study focusing on these compounds where they examined the relationship between the gut microbiome and the onset of atopy in the pediatric population. They're able to show that the highest risk group of children for develop um, atopic sensation was based upon ones that had a distinct fecal metabolome and rich for pro-inflammatory metabolites, particularly these dihomes. So you look in the figure up here, we see the dihomes here, as well as some other linoleic acid metabolites. And they reported that Levels of the 1213 dihome, which is the compound you see here from linoleic acid, actually reduce populations of T regulatory cells. And so they concluded in this that the neonatal gut microbiome dysbiosis actually can lead to increased levels of these linoleic acid dihome mediators, which then promote T cell dysfunction that's associated with the onset of childhood atopy. So we're seeing direct immune modulation associated with, in this case, the epoxide hydrolase products of dietary linoleic acid. Following up on this, 
they had an additional paper where they actually treated mice with the 1213 diome, and they saw increased pulmonary inflammation and decreased number of Treg cells. Looking in more detail, they actually looked at the different species of uh, bacteria in the gut and were able to identify associations between gene levels of the epoxide hydrolases and development of atopy or asthma in these children during childhood. So we see a direct relationship between the enzyme responsible for forming these diome products and microbiome, microbiome speciation in these kids. And so we're saying that, again, the linoleic acid compound, this 1213 diome that's being derived from oxidation linoleic acid, it's leading to reduction of regulatory T cells. And so we're seeing impeded immune tolerance and we're promoting the onset of childhood atopy and asthma in these kids. In a more recent associated report, we, a study from University of California, San Diego, um, they're showing here this kind of fancy network slide. It's just, it's a GNPS plot showing linoleic acid derived compounds, octadecanoids. And just very succinctly, they show, show that linole linoleic acid derived metabolites, so the octadecanoids, were higher in stool samples between preterm infants born to mothers with a history of asthma. So this is relative to mothers who do not have a history of asthma. So they conclude that maternal asthma actually alters the preterm infant's octadecanoid pathways in the gut. We're seeing this as early as in the first six weeks of life. So again, the dietary linoleic acid and the products thereof are affecting onset atopy in these children. To switch gears just a little bit to focus on some of the other um, interesting lipid meters out there, and I want to talk about a study that came out in Nature Comms a few years ago, where here they looked at the ability of the gut microbiota to convert linoleic acid to a compound called 10-HOME. And I don't know if you looked in detail, but on Dr. Brown's slides, in terms of the assays that they provided, this is the, this compound was there at the bottom, this 10-hydroxy, um, 12-Z octadecanoic acid. And this is an interesting compound that's been shown to, to be produced by the gut microbiome, and it can reduce adipose inf inflammation associated with a high-fat or high linoleic acid diet. And particularly showed that this 10 home activates two GPRs and it promotes GLP-1 secretion. And so they presented here a central mechanism where we see commensal or interplay between commensal bacteria and the host in response to um, increased linoleic acid in the diet and a way to actually convert resistance in the organism to developing obesity in response to this high fat diet. So it actually gives you a negative feedback system. But and this is a final point I want to make is that, okay, there's extreme structural complexity associated with these lipid mediated products, these octadecanoids. And so we're talking about here, this 10 home, this 10 hydroxy species. Looking at a study that came out in JCI just a couple months ago, they also report the 10 home, but this is not the same 10 home. 10 home up here, this is coming from oleic acid, not linoleic acid. So this is, has the unsaturation here at the eight position. So this is the 8E 10-home, um, whereas here, this is, was the 12Z. So even though we call it the 10-home, it actually is a different compound coming from a different substrate. And here they observed that levels of the 10-home in breast tissue in women who were suffering from breast implant illness were actually um, being produced by bacteria uh, biofilms that were forming in the breast tissue in response to these implants. And they were found that this 8E10 home can polarize T cells towards a TH1 subtype. And they, they concluded that we're seeing an octadecanoid mediated pathway for immune activation in these women who are suffering from breast implant illness. So the structural complexity of these mediators is very important. And we're talking about hundreds or thousands of different fatty acid drive molecules that have very subtle changes in structure in terms of oxygenation and double bond positioning and geometry, but can strongly affect the observed function. And that's what most of my lab has done, is worked on the analytical chemistry necessary to be able to quantify these metabolites. So I hope in these few minutes I've given you a flavor for what the octadecanoids are and the diverse and important functions they can exert. Um, but I've only focused on a couple of them. I, we talked a lot about the 1213 diome, and then I gave you examples of these two different 10 home species. But as we said at the beginning of the talk, there's thousands of these. And most of them have never been studied in detail. And we don't have a clear idea of how they're produced or their biological function. So 
there's a lot of work to be done. And one of the challenges we have, there's a lack of standardization in the field. We don't have chemical standards to do this. Most of these we synthesize in-house. There's a lack of domain expertise about octanoids and the processes that produce them and the functions that they're exerting in these different pathologies. Another way to look at this, there's a lot of opportunity here. And so one of the reasons I give this webinar like this is to raise awareness of these compounds and convince all of you out there that these are exciting and interesting compounds and certainly worth working on. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you for your attention. and be happy to entertain questions uh, in the Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much for your talk, um, Dr. Wheelock. Um, now our last speaker will be Dr. Sandhu. Um, Dr. Sandhu, I will be um, doing your slides and I will be uploading those shortly. Okay. So um, the last of uh, today's speakers, um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I want to spend probably six or seven minutes describing what we're doing at NOSCA in, in Kyoto. And uh, some of the key words are in this title, uh, biotransformation, postbiotics, and also um, some of the things that Craig just uh, touched on, I'll probably be looking at in a slightly different way, but hopefully complementing what he was saying. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide uh, illustrates um, our biotransformation process where we utilize our library of, a very large library of uh, microbes to convert raw materials into beneficial postbiotics. The process starts by selecting a specific strain from our collection. These microbes are then uh, cultured and subjected to controlled fermentation. And through this process, the microbes break down substrates producing bioactive compounds that we call postbiotics, which we then isolate and optimize and uh, prepare them for use in applications, including nutrition, cosmetics, and our biggest goal, uh, pharmaceuticals. Next slide, please. This is a slightly more detailed slide about what goes on in the, in the process. In chemical synthesis, it's difficult to selectively perform hydration reactions on multiple, multiple double bonds. But in our process, uh, we have pairs of bacteria and enzymes which are capable of recognizing the position of double bonds, making it possible to selectively catalyze hydration uh, reactions. And using this approach, um, various fatty acid metabolites can be synthesized from polyunsaturated fatty acids such as you know, lake acid and, and so on. So this is a very important uh, step in the whole production process. Next, please. Um, this is just um, a very general overview of some of the uh, microbes that we have. And uh, some of them are lactic acid bacteria, some are from, uh, which are based from, based on, uh, which are extracted from plants. And the others are gut bacteria, and microbes, which we have uh, about 1,600 strains. And this is our starting point for producing the uh, postbiotic compounds, that would, which I'll describe in detail now. Next, please. OK. Um, in 2022, I think, we published a, a paper um, which we where we focused on uh, analyzing fatty acid metabolites that were produced by gut microbes using um, LC mass uh, and lipidomics. And what we focused on was the uh, metabolization of polyunsaturated fatty acids, such as linoleic acid uh, by gut bacteria. The processes result in the production of various fatty, functional fatty, fatty acids, including hydroxo, oxy, conjugated and trans fatty acids as well. Our findings revealed that gut bacteria, or should I say gut microbiota, uh, play a very, very important role in the production of these metabolites, which exhibit, which exhibit uh, potential therapeutic effects, such as anti-inflammation uh, uh, properties. And we, to actually make things a bit simple, uh, label some of these products as HYA, HYC, HYB, and so on and uh, the actual 
chemical structure is shown on this uh, particular slide here. And this one is for linoleic acid. If we go to the next slide, please. This is for an alpha linolenic acid. Next one, please. And this is for a gamma version of the same acid. So we can get a, a huge range of uh, metabolites that we can produce using the appropriate combination of bacteria and the enzyme. And we now have a library of about uh, 300 of these metabolites. Next, please. Just a couple of slides to show uh, some trials that we've been carried out, carrying out. And this is a, a trial that was carried out using uh, on uh, 60 participants who had elevated blood glu glucose levels. And they took um, what we call HYA50, which is 50% purity HYA, 600 milligrams of it before a meal. And we tracked uh, their glucose levels over time. And there was a significant difference um, uh, between 30 and 60 minutes between the placebo and the actual HYA. Next one, please. This is another set of experiments. Uh, this is looking at visceral fat, the areas of vis visceral fat. Here we looked at uh, 56 participants who were mildly ob obese, and they took 1,800 milligrams of HYA, and we looked at their visceral fat over um, several weeks. And we found that um, after four to eight weeks, there was a gradual decrease in the visceral fat and a, and a significant reduction was confirmed after 12 weeks. Um, and the next slide, please. And this is uh, something which uh, Craig mentioned a few minutes ago um, that we're working on. Uh, and this is looking at how HYA acts on long chain fatty acids receptors, GPR40 and GPR120 in the gut, uh, inducing the secretion of GLP1, promoting insulin secretion, also enhancing POI secretion to suppress appetite. And these results, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to use for further trials uh, to look at uh, other more dire problems uh, related to, for example, diabetes and MASH, liver, liver function MASH as well. And the final slide, please. And I would just like to finish by mentioning the Nostra and Science Microbiome Prize, which we um, honors uh, uh, the, the groundbreaking work done by young researchers on the microbiome. And uh, we have a very, um, uh, what's the word, very enjoyable um, ceremony each year in Kyoto to celebrate the winners for that year. And this year's ceremony will be held um, on the 10th and 11th of October next month. Thank you very much for your attention.